name is Kimberly Mealy, and I'm the Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion and Ethics at the American Political Science Association, or APSA. APSA was founded in 1903, and we have over 11,000 members, and we are a founding member of the Science and Human Rights Coalition. We have a long-standing scholarly tradition of examining and making space for the consideration of ethics and human rights in the production of knowledge through engaged evidence-based research. The 49th president of APSA, Nobel Prize recipient, political scientist, Dr. Ralph J. Bunch, played a pivotal role in drafting the key chapters of the United Nations Charter, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In 1954, he was appointed the UN Under Secretary General, where he led peacekeeping initiatives and missions until the mid-1960s. In 1968, the APSA created the Committee on Professional Ethics to provide education, resources, and guidance on ethical matters for all, all political scientists. Today, we are pleased to bring to you a panel of experts to discuss the ethics of human challenge trials in the age of COVID-19, a framework for consideration and collaboration. I'd like to take a moment to introduce the panelists. First, Professor Seema Shah is an associate professor and, and the Founders Board Professor of Medical Ethics at Lurie Children's Hospital at Northwestern University. She was the lead author on an ethical framework for challenge studies published in science and a member of the World Health Organization Working Group for Guidance on Human Challenge Studies in the Era of COVID-19. COVID Professor Shaw will discuss the history of challenge studies, the hard ethical questions they raise, provide an ethical framework for their use to address COVID-19, and discuss whether and how a challenge study with the novel coronavirus might be ethically justified. Our second panelist is Dr. Jonathan Moreno. Dr. Moreno is the David and Lynn Silfen University professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where he teaches in the Perelman School of Medicine and the School of Arts and Sciences. Last year, along with the president of the university, he published a book entitled, Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven, But Nobody Wants to Die, Bioethics and the Transformation of Healthcare in America. Recently, Dr. Moreno has been called upon to offer his expertise on the impact of COVID-19 on the future of the bioethics field. This afternoon, he will discuss how the standard bioethics framework was a product of the post-war war era, how it may need to be revised considering the ongoing global crisis, and whether one notable product of the immediate post-war years, the Nuremberg Code, may provide clues about ethics of challenge trials. And then following Dr. Moreno, we will hear from Dr. P Pamela Bjorkman. Dr. Bjorkman is the David Baltimore Professor of Biology and Biological Engineering at Caltech. Her laboratory does basic and translational research to understand immune recognition of viral pathogens. They are particularly interested in understanding antibody responses against viruses in order to develop improved therapeutics and potential vaccines. As part of their approach, they investigate the structural correlates of broad and or potent antibody mediated neuralization of HIV-1, SARS-CoV-2, Zika, and the hepatitis C virus. Dr. Berkman is committed to helping the public understand science and she participates in the Caltech Science Exchange, providing evidence-based responses to community questions about the coronavirus. This afternoon, Dr. Berkman will be discussing SARS-CoV-2 infections and how vaccines could protect against the COVID-19 disease. And then finally, we'll, we will hear from Dr. Allison Dundas Rintown. Dr. Rintown is a professor of political science at USC and the chair of the APSA Ethics Committee. She has a PhD in jurisprudence and social policy from, from Berkeley and a JD from USC. Dr. Rintown is the co-editor of the Global Bioethics and Human Rights book, published in 2020. Her expertise includes law and public policy, human rights, and bioethics. 
Her publications focus on cultural rights, including the rights of minorities, persons with disabilities, and children. Dr. Realtown will assess the legitimacy of human challenge trials in the analytic framework of international human rights law. Her remarks will highlight the problem of obtaining truly informed consent, the protection of members of vulnerable groups, particularly children, and the need for a reconsideration of standard research ethics norms during emergencies. Let's start this afternoon by hearing from Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon, it's great to be here. Um, so my task is to orient us on challenge studies in general and how they might be used to address the COVID-19 pandemic. So first I'd like to just make sure we're all on the same page. What are controlled human infection studies and why are they referred to by so many different names? So you may have heard of them as human challenge trials or a controlled human infection model. CHIM is the typical acronym used there. I use the term CHIES, but the general um, approach or idea behind all of these terms is that these are studies where participants are deliberately exposed to a disease or a pathogen in order to rapidly test vaccines, or new interventions in a controlled manner, or to find out more about the early stages of a disease, often before people even are aware that they are infected. This picture is of a man who participated in a cholera study at the University of Maryland in the 1970s. And the reason he's holding up uh, the number 26 is because that's how many liters of intravenous fluid he needed to recover from the infection that was caused experimentally. And what's interesting about this and important to remember is that these studies can be quite burdensome, but have a long history of being conducted safely. What's also interesting about this history uh, is that as it's proceeded, there's been a lot of important scientific advancement and serious ethical concern, sometimes in the, at the same time. Um, but this long history really wasn't accompanied with sustained ethical analysis. It wasn't until 2001 that Frank Miller and Christine Grady wrote the first article on the ethics of controlled human infection studies, even though 1796 is when they were first used, when Edward Jenner um, inoculated his gardener's son, James Phipps, with smallpox after exposing him to cowpox. And that was the proof of concept for modern vaccination. So what's really interesting is that ethics has sort of been playing catch up to the science in this case. When I first became interested in the ethics of controlled human infection studies was during the Zika virus pandemic. And although this seems like a lifetime ago to most of us, um, during that time, Zika virus was spreading around the world. And there was a lot of concern about how far it would spread and whether it would stop. Um, There's a lot of concern because of congenital Zika syndrome, which caused severe microcephaly in infants um, and seemed to appear even after birth. Um, so this concern led people to consider the use of controlled human infection studies. And one investigator received uh, approval from NIH to proceed with a controlled human infection study. However, the NIH then recognized that this was incredibly ethically complex and to do a controlled human infection study on an emerging infectious disease raised a lot of challenging issues. At the time, I was really surprised to see how divided people were. So some people thought that Zika virus was such a terrible disease that it was really critical to use every tool in the arsenal to attack it. Others felt that it was such a terrible disease that it couldn't possibly be justified to expose people to Zika virus deliberately. Um, so our task as a panel was to determine whether a Zika virus human challenge trial could be ethically justified at that moment, and if so, under what conditions. And our multidisciplinary panel concluded that although Zika virus human challenge trials were ethically acceptable in principle, there were serious unknowns that would prevent it from proceeding at that moment. So the first was about the actual value that a Zika virus human challenge trial could contribute. In a pandemic, as we are seeing right now, there's so much research that happens in parallel. And as this research was speeding ahead, it wasn't clear to us how a challenge trial would fit into the ongoing research. Additionally, 
There were questions about third party risks, the worry that people who are infected with Zika at, inside the study could spread it to others outside the study. Um, and at the time, the CDC indicated that people were potentially infectious for six months after infection. It's fascinating to follow this uh, story, however, because a few months after we released our report, Zika virus field trials that were ongoing became very difficult to complete and then eventually were not able to complete because the outbreaks were so sporadic. The vaccine trails couldn't get to the sites in time. Um, so there's now challenge trials have emerged as the only way to test a Zika virus vaccine. And people still think that there might be future outbreaks of Zika virus. Additionally, it's also clear that people who have Zika virus are actually only infectious for about 30 days after infection. So these trials are now proceeding as clearly socially valuable but able and able to manage this third party risk. At the time, it was interesting to look at the ethics literature and see this emerging ethical consensus. There was a lot of agreement that although controlled human infection studies feel very counterintuitive and different, um, they aren't actually ethically distinct from other kinds of research. So if you consider phase one trials and healthy volunteers, those studies also have the same balance of exposing some people to risk in research for the benefit of others in society. And we accept those trade-offs in many cases, um, as long as sufficient protections are in place. There was also agreement that some controlled human infection studies were too risky to permit. There was generally uh, discussion around two potential ways to determine whether a controlled human infection study could be permissible. The first is whether there was a curative treatment available, uh, or if not, if the disease was self-limiting or likely to resolve on its own with supportive care. What's interesting about those criteria, however, is that influenza controlled human infection studies have been conducted for a long time and have been important for identifying correlates of protection against influenza, which is critical for being able to test vaccines quickly and efficiently. Um, and they, there aren't a lot of people who've raised ethical concerns about those studies. Finally, people thought that there were lots of other ethical considerations to apply based on the general ways that we review research. What I think was missing from this discussion and what made our task in, with the Zika panel so difficult is that controlled human infection studies raise a constellation of difficult and unresolved research ethics issues. So it's not that these are new, they've been around for a long time, but we haven't ever figured them out. So if you think about the right to withdraw from research in general, it's accepted in the, in the US regulations that the right to withdraw from research is something that should be unencumbered. People can withdraw at any time for any reason. However, when someone's been infected with a disease, if they withdraw, then they might be released into the community and be able to infect others. So balancing the limits of the right to withdraw with questions about third party risk is difficult, especially because third party risk is something that our regulations don't say anything about. Um, additionally, there's long been default exclusion of vulnerable populations. And only recently have we begun to recognize that that means that certain vulnerable groups are slow to get the benefits of research. So one big issue in the COVID-19 pandemic is the worry that children may, may not be included in vaccine testing sufficiently um, and if they're not included early enough, there will be a substantial delay for them to get the vaccine even after it's available for adults. Finally, there is a longstanding debate about whether there's an upper limit of risk in research, and if so, what that upper limit of risk is. So this led us to develop a project to, to produce a more rigorous and comprehensive ethical framework for controlled human infection studies with the support of the foundations here and in partnership with the World Health Organization. And this is our group at our first meeting. Um, the group involves both controlled human infection study researchers and ethicists. And we, as we, what, one of my big goals was to get these two people to talk to each other, um, which was, at first, a little bit challenging, but the babies in this picture helped a little bit. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So we were sort of wrapping up that work and finishing off an ethics framework when uh, the COVID-19 epidemic started to spread all around the world. 
And we're now at this interesting moment in time where unlike the Zika epidemic, this is the COVID-19 pandemic has affected just about everyone in profound ways. Um, the last thing I read was that the only continent that doesn't have COVID-19 is Antarctica. And this naturally led many to consider whether it would be ethically acceptable to use controlled human infection studies. In fact, you might say that it led to a rash of advocacy, people who were really saying that these studies should be used um, to address COVID-19. There are also now public plans for controlled human infection studies and some private ones. Um, the NIH has started developing strains for SARS-CoV-2 challenge trials, SARS-CoV-2 being the virus that causes COVID-19. But the idea is that these are only in case they're needed. So Tony Fauci describes this as not even a plan B. It's a plan C or a plan D if the vaccine trials don't pan out. The UK government just this week, however, announced that they plan to launch a challenge model to complement phase three trials. They haven't yet received ethical approval, but no doubt have already been in conversation with authorities in the country. So it's likely that these will move forward. Um, what our group did was try to develop an ethical framework to apply to challenge studies to address COVID-19 with the paper that Kim mentioned at the beginning of the session a key criteria document from the World Health Organization and a special issue of the journal Bioethics, which is out this month um, and addresses the ethics of controlled human infection studies in general, but with a number of papers which involve partnership between ethicists and challenge study researchers. So to summarize or condense all of that work, this has all come together in an ethical framework for controlled human infection studies, which has the following uh, benchmarks. So they must have sufficient social value or reasonable risk benefit profile, context specific community engagement, fair participant selection, suitable site selection, robust informed consent, and proportionate payment. Now, I won't have time to discuss all of these, so I'll just focus on the justification for controlled human infection studies to address COVID 19 and talk about their potential social value and the risks and benefits. And I'll note that if you are interested in these topics, you could read. Um, the papers in the special issue of our journal of the journal bioethics or for payment Holly Lynch and others have written a really comprehensive report on the ethics of payment for COVID-19 challenge studies. So to address social value first social value is refers to the magnitude distribution and likelihood of health benefits from research for populations. And this is really recognized as the foundational requirement for ethical research. Although institutional review boards regularly think about social value, they often think about it in uh, sort of ad hoc ways. They were try to determine that a study is scientifically rigorous and, and seems to be asking an important question that hasn't already been answered. Um, however, with high risk potential controversy from these challenge trials, more rigor seems required. So we argued it's actually important to be able to delineate a path from controlled human infection studies to health benefits. And there are several different potential paths uh, to this kind of social value. Now, the first proposal, which came from Nirial, Peter Smith, and Mark Lipsitch, was that these studies could replace vaccine efficacy testing. Their idea was that you could just take the third phase of vaccine efficacy testing, and instead of doing it in thousands of people and waiting for them to become infected naturally, you could use a controlled human infection and get an answer very quickly in many smaller numbers of people. This has a couple of problems. The first is that it's not clear that regulators would rely on this to decide that a vaccine should be licensed and marketed to incredibly large numbers of people. Um, if you're only testing a vaccine in 15 to 150 people through a sort of artificial route of administration and all of those people happen to be young and white, then it may it's hard to imagine that's sufficient data for um, rolling the vaccine out more broadly. The second problem is timing. So this comes from the New York Times. If you look at the tracker, 11 vaccines are in large scale efficacy testing. Although there are a few, six vaccines approved for earlier limited use, this is mostly in countries like China or Russia, um, where it's sort of unclear if those vaccines are actually ready for prime time. 
But the fact that so many vaccines have moved to large scale efficacy testing suggests that challenge trials aren't useful for this purpose. However, they may be useful to identify correlates of protection, which could be useful for future vaccine research. And this is the idea that you can tell there's some biomarker that, that can tell you when somebody is protected against the virus, and that gives you more power and more endpoints in these studies. The a third approach was that potentially they could teach more about transmission, since there's still a lot we don't know. Finally, it could be very helpful to prioritize vaccine candidates. So there are over 200 vaccine candidates at the moment. And if the first vaccine that is out of the gate to be licensed is not perfect, then we will need better second generation vaccines. And even if it is pretty much perfect, it's likely that we'll need more vaccines to reach all of the parts of the world. So um, this, is, this could be one way to quickly tell which of the other vaccines that are in production are the ones to prioritize. The second issue is to consider whether these studies would have a reasonable risk benefit profile. So generally that means that risks and benefits to participants should be systematically identified, evaluated, minimized and below an upper limit of risk in research. So there are some ways that risk could be minimized. You could enroll young, healthy adult participants at lowest risk, monitor them closely, and potentially um, not even have to have a rescue treatment available, even though they should be offered um, as many, whatever treatments are available. Um, and the reason I think is because if there's enough that's known about COVID-19 about minimizing risks. It's not clear that you have to have a rescue treatment. However, there's major uncertainty about this risk. So we're still finding long-term complications that are not fully understood and that seem to occur even with mild infection, including heart problems. And none of the treatments that are available are proven to reliably avoid severe complications or death. Dexamethasone is the only thing that it seems to reduce death reliably, and there's contested evidence about every other option. Some things have actually been proven not to work. Um, in our science paper, we looked at the different levels of risk in other already accepted activities, such as phase one trials or other controlled human infection studies. And we found that the risks of controlled human infection studies with the novel coronavirus are close to what's all, what limits are already accepted. And this is just considering the risks of mortality. But when you add in risks of hospitalization or these uncertain unknown risks, then it's much harder to tell whether we're in, we're getting close to what is already accepted. With regard to risk to third parties, however, if you think about the possibility that someone ha who has COVID-19 could transmit to others, this might be less concerning than when Zika virus controlled human infection studies because participants could be confined in a highly secure facility for about three weeks and personal protective equipment could be provided for research personnel. So this may be less concerning even though risks to participants are more concerning. So finally, I think it's important to note that conducting controlled human infection studies doesn't occur in a vacuum. If they are to happen, they occur in, uh, in light of the history of clinical drug trials, which includes exploitation of vulnerable populations, um, and also decreasing trust in our institutions. A study done in April found that only less than 60% of the U.S. population said that they would take a vaccine for the novel coronavirus. Um, and these numbers are actually decreasing in further research. And the problem is, I think, that risky research being conducted sends a signal to the public that maybe research that's being conducted isn't applying isn't being isn't using the highest standards and this could inadvertently undermine forms of broader longer-term collaboration and trust as jonathan kimmelman and alex linden have argued my worry is that challenge trials could affect trust in vaccines so one interesting paper actually found that when they asked people about this statement i worry that the rushed pace of testing for a new covid 19 vaccine will fail to detect potential side effects or dangers, 73% of people agreed with this statement. So it's possible that challenge trials feed into this perception in a way that could hurt us when we do, when we are so fortunate to have a vaccine to roll out.
So th what I'd like to leave you with is the notion that there is dynamic potential social value and risk of these controlled human infection studies for COVID-19. Due to their potential value, it's worth investing in them, but it's still a very close question on whether they are ethically justified. And it will require a robust, transparent process to determine whether they're ready for launch. Even if this justificatory step is passed, there's still many other ethical considerations and public trust to consider as well. Thank you. And I'd like to just acknowledge um, the members of our incredible team who've helped bring this all uh, to fruition. Thank you, Seema. Our next speaker will be Dr. Jonathan Moreno. Dr. Moreno. Hi, thank you. Thanks to, to uh, everybody who uh, made it possible for me to be part of this panel. And um, that's a great overview by Professor Shaw. Uh, I have uh, three key words uh, to uh, identify the parts of my 12 minute talk. Got my timer on. Uh, I'm going to be efficient. The first is geopolitics. The second is principles. And the third is limits. So the, the pharmaceutical R&D framework is part of what political scientists call the liberal international order. Um, this is the post-World War II framework of uh, multilateral institutions and co co implicit uh, consensus about various matters um, in finance, the World Trade Organization, uh, the International Monetary Fund, um, the UN itself, of course, the WHO. Um, and this system, the LIO, it's no secret, has been under stress uh, even before the Trump administration. Uh, including the uh, U.S. withdrawal from the WHO, whatever that actually means. Um, but the LIO, the Liberal International Order, also includes the research ethics system. So you think about uh, what I'll talk about in more detail, some provisions of the Nuremberg Code coming out of the Nazi doctors' trial after World War II, the Declaration of Helsinki, the Council for International Organizations of Medical Societies, the Oviedo Convention, the UNESCO uh, International Bioethics Committee, um, these are all part of the liberal international order. We may, may not thinking them that way, but they very much are. And there are certain assumptions that we make in the setting of clinical trials and research ethics that are part of this system. Informed consent is part of it, and phase trials um, and randomized control study is also part of it. Um, there is some indication, I guess you could say, that uh, there is a, a kind of vaccine nationalism emerging now that's pushing back against this set of rules. Um, others on the panel, perhaps especially Professor Shaw, will know more about this, but my understanding based on reporting is that uh, China has not completed its uh, Sinovax phase three study, but thousands of these, uh, of these doses are already being distributed, particularly in Brazil. Uh, Russia is talking about a second vaccine without going through all of the phase, phase three uh, statistical analysis process, collecting data. So. Uh, there is uh, there is a kind of pushback, it seems to me, against the LIO with respect to uh, that system, which could be problematic. Um, so um, are we entering a period of vaccine nationalism is the last question, the rhetorical question that I will act actually come back to at the end of my brief remarks. Can the research ethics framework survive this period? So part two of my uh, brief talk is about the bioethics principles, which is kind of inside baseball in a way in the World Series, but um, it's all inside bioethics, but we all learn about these principles. You take one bioethics course and you're, you're consumed with respect for autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. Just to say about the history of uh, bioethics and human research ethics that this framework really emerged in the post, in what we thought was the post-infectious disease era. A Surgeon General in 1970 said the era of infectious disease is over. If there's one paper that ever the author ever wanted to withdraw, it was surely that one. Ten years later, we had HIV AIDS. And now uh, in this pandemic, of those four principles, the justice is the last and I think the least well articulated by people in bioethics. And we don't really operate in, a, in, the, in the framework in bioethics of a, of a, a well-conceived public health standard. As a matter of fact, I think public health ethics is sort of the very much the last among equals in most of the textbooks and bioethics that you look at. And so this is why I think that um, we may, may, may be in for a major rethink about uh, the concept of bioethics over the next couple of years. So now to the, the last and um, most of my comments will really be following on to um, what some of what Professor Shaw has talked to us about. 
I'm a little suspicious. She, she uses the, the, the term chives. Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume, Professor Shaw, that's not because you work in Chicago, but I'm a little, I'm a little suspicious. Um, it happens that uh, she, she cited the Frank, the Miller and Grady paper, a very important paper in this setting. And I want to acknowledge that Frank Miller and I are working on another paper now. And um, my, many of the ideas that I'm going to be talking to you about the next seven and a half minutes uh, come out of the preparation uh, for that paper. So um, two major historical incidents I want to mention. One that Professor Shaw mentioned, uh, uh, the, the Yellow Fever Commission under Major Walter Reed in 1900, 1901. Uh, two people died in that, uh, in that process, both uh, healthcare professionals. One was a physician named Jesse Lazier, the other a nurse named Clara Moss. And yet there's no question but that uh, Yellow Fever Commission made an enormous contribution to public health. The second uh, incident that I need to mention is the Nuremberg Nazi doctor's trial itself, uh, a, a very complicated, important story uh, that in which uh, there are detailed, brutal Nazi medical experiments conducted in concentration camps. Out of the Nazi doctor's trial comes the famous Nuremberg Code. I like to tell my students there are uh, two documents that are uh, always cited and almost never read in, in medical ethics, uh, the Hippocratic Oath and the Nuremberg Code. So I'll come back to a couple of the elements of the Nuremberg Code that actually, interestingly, I think may provide us with some guidance with respect to the ethics of, of chives. I'm going to try to get used to that term. Now, of course, since uh, the Nazi doctor's trial and the, the advent of the Nuremberg Code, uh, there have been numerous experiments, uh, also mentioned by Professor Shaw, involving malaria, cholera, influenza, dengue, and other diseases under controlled, controlled conditions with careful attention to uh, minimizing risk to, to subjects and the approval of research ethics committees and valuable knowledge has emerged from uh, all of these studies. But until recently, um, there really has been very little discussion about uh, the ethics of challenge studies, uh, including even in the bioethics literature. Um, but I think now, obviously, you know, this, this event is helping to be part of a change, a very important change to reconsider uh, where we stand with the ethics of chais. So, um, there are several provisions of the Nuremberg Code that turn out to be relevant here, um, even though I should say the Nuremberg Code emerged out of a very extreme set of circumstances with the trial of uh, Nazi doctors and medical bureaucrats. Nonetheless, the, the, the judges who articulated the code um, really thought through some details that very few of us have thought through since then. The, the, the first uh, is a provision of the code that precludes studies, and I'm quoting now, from the code where there is an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury will occur. Now, it's interesting that um, in all these years, there really is no consensus on the vital question that, that Professor Shaw has been working on. What are the limits to, uh, of risk to healthy volunteers that could be justified in a study with significant social and scientific value? So suppose that um, a program of uh, chives for coronavirus recruited uh, 100 young healthy participants. And if we, if we agree, which I think we can, that the risk of death and serious disease to a group of young healthy volunteers um, would be less than one in 100, then if you had fewer than 100 volunteers, uh, you wouldn't expect to have a risk of death or serious injury. And I, 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 it's notable, at least according to what the reporting I've seen, that the Imperial College study has 90 volunteers, which would meet that standard. I don't know how they, I'm sure they arrived at, uh, the, at the number 90 because of some fancy biostatistics that I would never understand. But it is interesting to me that they get to the point of um, under 100. The, the second provision of the code that I want to mention that is relevant is that, again, quoting, that the degree of risk to be taken should never exceed that determined by the humanitarian importance of the problem to be solved by the experiment. I, I think we can agree that the humanitarian importance, just thinking about the, the, the add-on effects of, to our economies and to our psychology, to human relations, to our politics, the humanitarian importance of, of at least one uh, effective vaccine, safe and effective vaccine, a reliable vaccine is terrifically important. And finally, uh, the experiment should be such as to yield fruitful results, again, the language of the code, for the good of society, unprocurable by other methods or means of study, and not random and unnecessary in nature. So 
all together, these elements of the code really add up to what uh, Professor Shaw called kind of the social value requirement that we, uh, we, we take seriously. So given all that, could a challenge study uh, ethically speed vaccine development? Uh, does it meet the social value requirement uh, given risks to young healthy participants giving informed consent? Would it not be excessive? Therefore, uh, should it be conducted? So I have two questions that I would just, uh, rhetorical questions. Um, would such a study have the potential at this point with all of the vaccine candidates that are out there and the movement in phase from phase two and into phase three at, uh, as we sit here today, would they actually expedite vaccine development in the, in the context of all of these multiple research effort, efforts that are already going on? Um, my second question is a little vaguer because frankly, I haven't thought it out all that well, but uh, toward the end of Professor Shaw's talk, she actually kind of got to this. Uh, would such a study, will such a study, the, the one that's being uh, planned in the UK in particular, given where we are, would it be a useful comparison? Would it be a useful comparison with other vaccines that are moving through phase three? Or would it lead to confusion, uh, a babble of vaccines? Uh, um, so Professor Shaw used the word complementing phase three trials. Uh, would it complement them or would it create more confusion next year? Hopefully creating that confusion next spring when there's uh, you know, pretty reliable data coming out of phase three of some of the candidate vaccines. In other words, and I'll, I'll end with this, um, will our current vaccine nationalism with different countries doing grabs for different intellectual property and making deals with various countries that you know, could not perhaps produce these uh, vaccines, do, do full R&D on their own, will vaccine nationalism lead to a kind of vaccine babble that will create more confusion uh, than it will be helpful? Thank you, Dr. Moreno. Next, we will hear from Dr. Pamela Bjorkman. Dr. Bjorkman. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm, I hope I'm sharing my screen now. So I, this is my first um, meeting of this order. I don't normally go to anything but scientific, strictly scientific meetings. So this has been really interesting to me and thank you for having me. Okay, so I'm gonna start by just saying that this is what viruses have been selected over millennia to do. Basically, they deliver their genetic material to a host cell. They take over the host biosynthetic machinery to make more copies of themselves. They assemble the new copies in the infected cell and then they release them. So in particular, SARS-CoV-2, there's a number of coronaviruses, but SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus and just to introduce you to, to a few things about it, it has a lipid membrane, which is the red thing. Uh, it's a so-called envelope virus. And then I'm gonna be talking about the spike protein, which is the part that sticks out, gives us its name of coronavirus, and then latches onto a cell to infect it. So this is just a very simplified version of what happens. Again, the life cycle summary is you enter the host cell, you, uh, the virus makes copies of itself and then it releases new viruses. And the way it enters the host cell is that the spike protein binds to this receptor, which is called the ACE2 receptor. That is in your body not to be a receptor for viruses, but it's in there in order to regulate your blood pressure. And it's expressed in multiple organs throughout your body, especially in the lungs. But there's a reason that SARS-CoV-2 has effects on multiple organs, and that's because of ACE2 receptor uh, expression. So vaccines can prevent viruses from infecting cells to turn them into factories to make more viruses. So that's the hope for a vaccine. Now, most vaccines work by inducing what are called neutralizing antibodies. And I'll define antibodies later, but these are proteins in your blood, which can then diffuse into your tissue, and they're raised in response to pathogens. And what a neutralizing antibody would do is it would bind to, in this case, the spike protein. And now the spike protein can't bind to the ACE2 receptor. And so the virus won't get into your cell. So all the rest of these steps are just over. So that's the hope for neutralizing antibodies. And in animal studies, these are the correlates of protection for most vaccines. And uh, in particular, 
for attempts to make vaccines that have been tested in animals against SARS-CoV-2, it's neutralizing antibodies. And that's what they're looking for in evaluating the vaccine trials. So just a little bit more about antibodies. These are proteins in your blood, but they can diffuse into your tissues. They're there to combat pathogens. And what they look like is a Y-shaped molecule. And there's a part called the FAB, which is fragment antigen binding. That's the part that's different from one antibody to another. So that's the part that would be specific for, let's say, a particular virus. But they could be against anything that you get infected with bacteria, yeast, and fungi, and so on. So the definition of an antibody that neutralizes a pathogen is that it prevents, let's say it's a virus from infecting the target cell. And that means no more viral progeny. And so the amazing thing about our immune system as a mammal is that we have the ability to make, you know, over 10 to the 16th different types of antibodies. Those are represented at the bottom as different colors. And so if you're making an immune response to a virus, you don't make just one antibody to that virus, you make a whole collection of them. And so if you've heard of convalescent serum or plasma, this, these are collected from people who have had COVID-19 disease, and that will be a so-called polyclonal mixture of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, because you're gonna make a lot of different antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, some of which are neutralizing, some of which are not, some of which are really potently neutralizing, some of which are weakly neutralizing and so on. So probably the reason that the convalescent serum doesn't work all that well for uh, in the trials it's been tested in is that a lot of these antibodies are not particularly uh, potent at neutralizing. So what people have been doing is isolating defined antibodies from these mixtures from patients who've actually had COVID-19 and then using ways in the laboratory to actually produce these and then have what's called a monoclonal antibody. So they may have discovered that the, the pink one and the green one from this mixture from a particular person are really potent and then they'll give that as a cocktail. So I'm sure you've all heard of the Regeneron cocktail of monoclonal antibodies that was given most recently to Donald Trump. And so that is an example of defined monoclonal antibodies, two of them that were given to patients and that's under clinical trials right now. So you can also try to raise these antibodies. Those are given in the absence of trying to have the host raise their own antibodies. But if you want the host to raise antibodies so that the host is protected, what you would do is a vaccine. So let's go through the viral life cycle again. I'm only going to start with the point where uh, the virus has been released from the infected cell, and that's recognized by the immune system now, the virus is. And what happens is the virus is like eaten up by certain types of cells that are called antigen presenting cells. Antigen just means whatever the pathogen is. And then that interacts with a so-called, with a type of lymphocyte called a T helper cell. And the T helper cell helps the type of lymphocyte called a B cell actually make antibodies. So that's one aspect of your immune system, which involves these the potential making of these types of antibodies that I've been talking about. You can also have another type of T lymphocyte called a cytotoxic or killer T cell, and that just kills infected cells. And when it kills infected cells, there's a massive amount of sort of release of garbage material and your immune system reacts to that and it can go out of control to make inflammatory responses. And so if you've heard of cytokine storm, that can develop after the virus is totally gone from someone. It will develop so that they are making really off target in excessive inflammatory responses that actually can actually can kill people in the end. And at that point, the virus may not even be there. And it's really impossible to predict who will mount inflammatory responses beyond the necessity to clean up this virus. Because again, it's happening mostly after the virus is gone from the person's body. Okay, so the, the goal of a vaccine would be to make long lived memory lymphocytes, either of the B type or the T type. And these would recognize the virus if you ever got exposed to it again. And so this type of memory response 
is really amazing. That's the whole basis for how vaccines are can work. And I want to give you this example here, which is that immunological memory can be so powerful that you can get lifelong immunity to an infection. And measles is a good example of this. So in 1781, these Swedish sailors come and they brought measles virus to the Faroe Islands. The people on the islands had never been exposed to measles before, so a lot of them got sick and died. The survivors then had lifelong immunity because later uh, another ship came years later with measles infected sailors, no measles in the meantime between 1781 and 1846. And people who are old enough to have been infected with the first set of measles did not get measles because they had lifelong immunity, which is really pretty amazing. Unfortunately, it appears that immunological memory to coronaviruses is probably shorter. This is based on, as you may know, there are four types of coronaviruses that circulate amongst us all the time. These cause common colds. And I would say there's like a 99% probability that everyone here has been infected with at least one of these. And the immunological memory from studies of these common cold coronaviruses suggests that the memory is much more short lived. But I wanna say that isn't exactly, that isn't really bad news necessarily because sometimes vaccines induce different types of immune responses than a natural infection. In fact, they would always induce a different type of immune response, but sometimes they're actually better. So if you get a natural infection with human papillomavirus, the immune response isn't very robust and it isn't long lasting but the HPV vaccine that's given these days actually triggers better antibody responses than natural infections. And so those types of vaccines for HPV are based on what are called virus-like particles. And it's not an infectious version of HPV because it doesn't have its nucleic acid, so it can't actually infect. So I want to now go back to this slide here where we talked about what the what sorry what the immune responses actually are so some vaccines induce both antibody and t cell responses others induce only antibody responses so if you remember this here we had uh if you if you go to this part if you go to the upper part where you see the t helper cell helping the b cell and then helping it make antibodies so the virus in this case can be attacked by antibodies but T cells can actually work on attacking infected cells. So it's kind of nice if you have both. And just this here from a review on the available vaccines these days, there are many different types of them, which I won't go into in detail, but let me just say, if you have virus-like particles like the HPV vaccine, those would induce antibodies only. If you have just protein subunits in a different type of vaccine, they induce antibodies only. Uh, if you have, you can inactivate a virus and make a vaccine, those would induce antibodies only. But if you have nucleic acids vaccines, if you've heard of the Moderna vaccine, that's a nucleic acid based vaccine, those would induce antibodies and T cells. Uh, a weakened type of attenuated vaccine would also induce antibodies and T cells, and then various types of replicating and non replicating uh, viral vectors would induce antibodies and T cells. So here from a New York Times article is just the definition of phase one, phase two, and phase three, which I think everyone understands, but a lot of these um, vir potential vaccines have been in phase one and phase two, uh, fewer, but at least some have been in actually phase three also. Now they're combining phase one with phase two now. So the idea is they'd probably look at safety and whether or not they do something. And usually what they're looking for is neutralizing antibodies. So a number of them have been through phase one and phase two. Phase three, you really have to do, you know, tens of thousands of these in order to actually see if there are potentially long-term adverse effects. And then, then of course you have to produce large scale amounts of them. And they're actually doing this at the same time as conducting the clinical trials. So I'll just show you the same New York Times uh, thing that tracks the vaccines these days. This is as of yesterday. So six of them, uh, 11 of them are in phase three and six are approved for early or limited use. Oh, that's my timer. So I'm done now and I will stop sharing. Thank you, Professor Bjorkman.
And our final speaker is uh, Dr. Allison Dundes Rintown. Dr. Rintown. Thank you very much uh, to the AAAS for sponsoring this conversation and thanks to APSA for the uh, championing of ethics concerns in, in the social sciences. So uh, my focus is on how international human rights law applies to human challenge uh, studies. And I'll speak briefly about why uh, reasons both historical and contemporary why people have concerns about these uh, studies, mainly from the point of view of human rights. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, provisions in human rights law. Uh, my basic view is that human challenge trials cannot be justified because they involve using people as a means to an end. And that's fundamentally inconsistent with the human rights perspective. However, since these trials, as we've heard, are going forward, uh, it's important that they, we regulate them as carefully as possible uh, to protect human rights. And I'll try to, if time permits, make a few suggestions about that. So just to begin about what are some of the reasons people are concerned, my colleagues have covered this to some extent, but uh, the idea is that scientific advancement and technological innovations often occur before we have time to think through the ethical implications. And of course, we're very indebted to the scientists and biomedical professionals uh, for finding cures to dreaded disease. You know, if, if it were not for their work, we wouldn't have found a, a cure, a way to end polio mostly in the world. And we certainly urgently need a vaccine. Uh, but I guess the, 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 the concern people have is that in this rush to find a cure, uh, maybe we need to exercise some caution to avoid the abuse of power. So uh, time doesn't permit us to review the sad history of abuses. Uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned some of the more notorious examples, the Nazi experiments, the Tuskegee experiments, uh, and so on. Uh, more recently, uh, there were um, unethical trials conducted that were exposed by uh, Public Citizens Health Research Group, where in India, there were two uh, uh, rotavirus vaccines available, but children in India were given a placebo, and that uh, violated uh, human research ethics. It would have been impermissible in the United States to give infants a placebo where a known treatment exists in that case. But I wanted to touch briefly on two of the more, more controversial examples of human subjects research, um, one of which in, involved a human challenge trial, and that's the, the Willowbrook case. And I think it's important to emphasize how children are often victimized in research. Uh, they're clearly one of the groups of the vulnerable groups, uh, the subject to exploitation. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing that is that the, the, in human rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been ratified by every country in the United States, every country in the world, except the United States. We're, it's a disgrace that we are the only country not to have ratified that treaty. And so one could argue that we failed our children uh, in, in, in protecting their human rights and in particular in research experiments. So the Willowbrook case involved one of the most horrendous violations of research ethics it's considered to be fundamental to the disability rights movement. And as, as many of you probably know, um, this was in the 50s and 60s where uh, doctors deliberately uh, infected uh, hundreds of children with hepatitis. Um, they did other experiments as well, but that was by far the most controversial. And uh, some of the doctors involved uh, published papers, uh, Dr. Krugman, I think won the, the prestigious Lasker Award and was admitted to the National Academy of Sciences. So this was a, an example of where children with disabilities were intentionally infected with hepatitis uh, by the manipulation of their parents. The parents were told that they basically had to agree to these experiments in order for the children to be able to stay in, in the institutions. And um, so there was really no informed consent. Um, and the point I want to emphasize is that Krugman justified these experiments through a utilitarian approach, that more children would be helped by this research than the number, than the number harmed. And I want to challenge this, this tendency to use a utilitarian cost-benefit analysis, which pervades, I think, the entire field of, of bioethics. Um, and um, my colleague, Professor Moreno, in his classic and, and brilliant study, Undue Risk, notes that the funding for this research at Willowbrook uh, 
came from uh, the Armed Forces Epidemiological Board, so that you know our government is complicit in the in these studies. The second example I'll briefly mention was uh, research ethics in Nigeria uh, that also led to litigation. Uh, I didn't mention, but in the Willowbrook case, there was later a class action, so there was liability for this unethical research. The the second example. Uh, is uh, from a case called Abdullahi versus Pfizer. And uh, uh, Pfizer uh, recruited uh, 200 sick children for treatment and 11 of them died in these clinical trials. And a report was issued by Nigerian medical experts showing that Pfizer had violated international law by using an unapproved drug on children. Uh, Pfizer never obtained a, a authorization from the government. There was no informed consent. Uh, the, they were supposed to read the subjects, uh, the protocol, either in English or in their native language, Hausa, but th that didn't occur at all. So th there was protracted litigation, but eventually there was a settlement out of court in 2009 um, for millions of dollars, $75 million, and Pfizer agreed to set up a fund of $35 million to fund community projects. But what the court held during the course of the litigation, which is important for our consideration, is that non-consensual drug trials violate customary international law, that that norm is universally recognized. And so that was an important um, uh, decision by the court. Now, if we shift from the discussion of these examples of research ethics to the human challenge trials, I think the concerns are some of those that have been mentioned. First of all, the research uh, does not have available a rescue treatment. And so there's a question about whether it's justifiable to proceed without having a rescue therapy or treatment. Dr. Shaw discussed that. I think the second concern is whether paternalism is warranted where people want to sacrifice themselves. So we're talking primarily about younger, younger people, uh, you know, 24,000 people in 102 countries, some are part of this one day sooner movement, should individuals 18 to 30 be able to basically sacrifice themselves um, and, you know, there's a huge risk. The concern is there's extraordinary risk, and some people have already died in some of the clinical trials. Another reason concer for concern is sociological research shows that young people are often risk takers. There's a, an interesting book called Edgework that deals with young people wanting to be heroic, wanting to have sensational experiences, and so there may be, be a justification for some paternalism. The analogy in the literature that's usually drawn is that the human subjects are similar to professional rescuers. And I guess there's some question whether that's really a, a fair analogy. But I think fundamentally, the discussion of having young people want to sacrifice themselves for the greater good is a utilitarian uh, kind of approach. And it's also predicated on the idea that individuals have the right to die. So let me turn to the human rights uh, provisions since I think I have very little time left. And um, the, uh, the uh, I guess I, I wanna indicate that I'm shifting from what I see as a utilitarian approach used in the analysis of biomedical ethics to a different mode of analysis, which philosophers call uh, deontological or categorical reasoning. So the difference is that most of this research weighs costs and benefits and, and, and tries to sort of make predictions about the future um, based on assessments of risk and what are the potential harms and benefits. But a deontological approach looks at the intrinsic nat nature of an action to determine whether it's moral and not on the consequences. So this is a fundamentally a distinction between a categorical form of moral reasoning and a, a consequentialist approach. And many of you may be more familiar with the Kantian notion that people should not be used as a means to an end. So human rights law is based on a more categorical approach. The people have fundamental human rights, which some of which cannot be suspended, some of which are non-derogable. So here's the main idea from human rights law, which is even if there's an emergency, there are some human rights that cannot be suspended, cannot be abrogated. And there are various provisions in human rights law. There's a treaty, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Article four deals with what rights may be suspended. Article 15 of the European Convention on Human Rights. There's a set of principles called the Syracuse principles, 
But the main point is that when human rights law is applied to situations where you have an emergency, some of the rights are considered to be non-derogable. That is to say, a state cannot suspend them even if there's a pandemic. One of the most important human rights in, in relevant to our discussion is Article 7. Article 7 provides, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. In particular, no one shall be subjected without his free consent to medical or scientific experimentation. And Article 7 of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, is a treaty the United States has ratified. It's ratified by virtually all countries in the world. And this article is a non-derogable right. That is to say, it can never be suspended. And in, in interpretations of Article 7, the Human Rights Committee has said that the, the notion of free consent means informed consent. And since there's so much uncertainty about the vaccine uh, and being tested in these trials, it's pretty clear that informed consent cannot be given. Uh, we simply don't have the information uh, available. Um, so I don't have really time to go through the other human rights treaties, but they deal with questions about whether, for example, people with disabilities can be part of experiments if, if, and how you uh, handle the issue of informed consent. The Convention on the Rights of the Child has a provision, Article 24, that says children have rights against traditions which are prejudicial to their health. There was originally a, a plan to have informed consent be part of that, but it was not included. Uh, Dr. Maya Sabatello's uh, brilliant book, Children's Bioethics, deals with this in detail in chapter two. But another key right relevant for us is the right to health, which is guaranteed in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It says that there's a right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. And uh, it, it, so I guess that involves various questions about whether health professionals have a duty to treat. And we could have a conversation about that. But these are among some of the principles that are relevant from human rights law, which would seem to militate against the use of human challenge trials. The other two rights I would like to mention are the right to a remedy and reparations. The United Nations has adopted a human right to a remedy and reparations, which would mean that in those instances where people are in these trials and they fall ill, that there would be an obligation on the part of governments or the WHO to provide some kind of support, medical care, or, or you know, maybe uh, financial support for families. But I think interesting uh, for some of you may be that there's no right to die in human rights law. So with regard to whether young people should be able to sacrifice themselves, human rights law would not support euthanasia. There's no, there's no right to die. Um, there's a right against arbitrary, arbitrary deprivation of life, um, but there's no, uh, no uh, right to die. So the last point I wanted to make was just what should be done since these trials are gonna go forward anyway. First of all, to ensure that there's really rigorous and robust informed consent, we should have videotaping of the informed consent. And as Dr. Shaw mentioned, people should have the ability to withdraw. I also think children and younger people should, should clearly not be part of these uh, studies. Individuals with intellectual disabilities or people with dementia should, not, should be excluded. And that we should try to avoid the politicization of the scientific process. Long ago, we could trust our institutions. In the FDA, we had Dr. Francis Kelsey, who stood firm when Merrill executives were in a hurry to market thalidomide. And she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, fame joining Eleanor Roosevelt, Helen Keller, Margaret Mead, and others. And I think right now we're worried about whether under the current administration, whether the institutions that are supposed to protect us are capable of doing so. So I think we should be skeptical, skeptical about a rush to use human challenge trials in the absence of knowledge when we know people cannot give informed consent. Human rights should not be abrogated during an emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renteln. And I know that we have a few questions from the audience. Um, and I'd like to, before we get to that, um, like to turn quickly to Dr. Um, or Professor Shaw, uh, just to, get your feedback or your response to this notion that bioethics is utilitarian. I, mean, I know you have some thoughts on that as well. 
Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, these are, these have been really nice thought provoking presentations. What I was, I think it's interesting. There's a debate within bioethics about how utilitarian it should be. And a lot of utilitarians are actually concerned that it's too deontological. Um, I myself consider myself a deontologist who cares about consequences. Um, so I think that, you know, in this case, what we're, we're not talking about just a cost benefit analysis. And even though what I focused on was social value versus risk, it's important to recognize there are many other considerations that I didn't have time to talk about that are still relevant. And beyond that, just the requirement for voluntary informed consent is an important constraint on making those cost benefit trade offs. So no one is arguing, I think that we would just take people against their will and deliberately expose them to a disease, which has been done in research in the past, and has rightly been criticized as unethical. So I think in my view, it, it, it's important to recognize that even under a deontologist's view, um, bioethics does permit some research, but has important constraints. And it's just that the first question you ask is whether it's justified to even ask people to participate in it. Thank you, Professor Shaw. So one of the questions that we have from the audience is as follows. Uh, and I'd like to direct it to the panel, whoever would like to respond. Uh, in terms of equity and ethics um, with regard to challenge trials, are impoverished communities more likely to participate given a heightened need for the payments that they might receive for their participation? Who would like to address that? Dr. Moreno? Well, I can start. Um, so this is a, a problem. Payment is a problem that IRBs you know, struggle with frequently. Um, the, the, in general, it's thought that the safest approach, in quotes, is reimbursement uh, for expenses, not compensation, in quotes. Of course, uh, that's only a starting point for the ethics analysis. So who gets reimbursed for what? Uh, do I get reimbursed for my inconvenience being out of work for a day? Is that different from what somebody else would be reimbursed for? Um, elder care, child care, uh, lodging that's provided, uh, fuel costs to, to get to the site, that's all thought to be part of reimbursement. Um, as lawyers would say, uh, the, you're not supposed to be given any in undue inducement. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad the law professor is shaking her head on this. I we get that wrong. So, um, but in general, not only for challenge studies, but any any uh, any study that involves a, a vulnerable population, an SES, a social economically uh, deprived group or vulnerable group, you want to have. Uh, you know, the hard part is the planning and implementation that engages people within the community. So that's, those are, you know, some of the rules of thumb, they don't really differ for, in that, in those respects from uh, payment for challenge. If I could add to that, the, um, I think one issue is that in terms of equity for people who do have other burdens, if they're not paid um, or reimbursed in that way, then they can't participate. So ensuring broader participation and not asking people to take on the subsidize the research can be an important reason for payment. Um, with regard to undue inducement, we did a qualitative study of some malaria challenge study volunteers and found that some of them did in fact withhold some information from the study team. And it was interesting, they sort of thought it wasn't relevant or important. So I think they're in to deal with that worry about undue inducement, you could both make sure that the way that you determine whether someone's eligible is all objective and not reliant on what they tell you, but also tell people about why it's important that they're honest about various things that could put them at higher risk. Thank could, I just, could I just add, I'm sorry, Kim, I was just gonna ask, I mean, the, the people can't be given information when they're being screened for, I'm more concerned about the researchers not being able to give adequate information to the, to the participants, to the subjects, than, you know, than the question of the cost. But I mean, if, if cost is, I, I, I think there shouldn't be any kind of compensation as an inducement uh, in these kinds of studies. And I think that uh, the fact that uh, people are being asked to participate in the absence of knowledge is, is, is what's more problematic than the compensation issue that, that comes up in all research. 
Thank you. Say, can I say one other, other thing, Kim, not to uh, lengthen the answers to this, but just to get into the debate about deontology and utilitarianism, not really that happy with the framing of the, um, the conceptual scheme, but nonetheless, you know, we are kind of accustomed to that. But there's a non, there's a non deontological, non utilitarian uh, rationale for letting people participate in clinical trials and contributing to science, which is, you know, what you might call social solidarity or human solidarity. Uh, I have tried unsuccessfully to get into the Moderna trial, for example. I guess they got enough old white guys my age, uh, you know, and my general demographic. Um, but I think, you know, I would I would like to be part of that. If anybody's listening and get me that study, I'm only about eight, you know six or seven miles away from the center in in, in Maryland. Uh, you know, I would like to because I think it is an expression of something, and it's not about duty, uh, and it's not about the not about uh, you know cost benefit analysis. Um, and Lord knows if there, anything we need right now, it's statements of human solidarity. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. Um, another question that we've received is the following. How have informed consents been handled um, when there's very limited information? And the particular context of this question refers to um, an example of persons with disabilities. Uh, as it relates to producing a vaccine. How do you account for proper dosing and side effects for people <clears throat> if they are not included in the trials or the discussions? I, I could, if, if I could start, I think um, it is, people are recognizing it's important to include different populations into trials. Uh, the Moderna trial that Jonathan was just referring to is a trial where they paused and started to enroll people with, um, enroll more minorities. I think that there is this question that's inherent to research that there's uncertainty about the risk that's involved. And that's true for different populations. It's true for challenge studies with emerging infectious diseases. Um, it's true for you know phase one trials where we're trying a drug for the first time, but it's also true for almost everything we do in life, right? When you start, when you get married to somebody, you consent to be with them and you don't know a lot about what will happen in your lives. Um, so I don't think uncertainty is, is going to defeat the possibility of giving voluntary informed consent. I do think that the way that people have handled in the past is to be upfront about that uncertainty, to explain what isn't known, to update informed consent documents as new information emerges. And then also in challenge studies, there's a lot of testing of people on uh, various key concepts to make sure that they understand it. And if people don't pass the test, um, then they aren't admitted into the trials. Thank you. And I'd like to just ask one final question. I see that we have three minutes uh, remaining. I'd like to start with Professor Bjorkman. Um, if human trials, human challenge trials are deemed safe in the US context, what source of coordination between scientists, public health officials, ethicists, policymakers will need to take place in order to move forward in a safe, ethical, efficient way? Um. I'm sorry, I really can't answer that because to me, the science isn't there yet to do this. And I wanna to point to that apparently, like if you look at people who've had COVID-19, even asymptomatically, um, there's like oh, two thirds of them have cardiac issues uh, that are, that are you can see in certain um, scans that, that MDs do, but nobody knows if these will be long-term or not. So I can't imagine how anyone would say that right now we know enough to do challenge trials. There's a lot of like gut involvement that people aren't talking about that much, but I talked to gastroenterologists and so people who got over their lung problems then have gut involvement for months. And it's not because of the virus. I wanna emphasize that. It's your immune response to the virus and you have no way of predicting who's going to have that out of control inflammatory response to the virus. So I don't understand how this could ever be done safely. So I can't even go to the next step of this. Thank you. Would another panelist like to chime in? I, I can add to that. I do think that a lot of people agree with 
Professor Bjorkman, that it that these studies aren't ethically acceptable, but it's interesting that the UK is moving forward. Um, so there is this question that if they're done, you know, what should people who have doubts about those studies do about them? There's still, I think, um, is an, a, an important question about whether a treatment will emerge um, before the studies are launched. But assuming that doesn't happen, uh, I do think that participants will have to be informed about these potential risks. And then the coordination is really to ensure that these studies actually have value. Um, so one of the biggest parts of coordination is that, you know, challenge trials are just a piece of a larger puzzle. Um, how is it that we know that the data will be transferred to other scientists and other policymakers to actually make a difference in the world? Um, so that's some of the coordination. I think also having ethicists review uh, the protocols and vet them in advance will be important. But the justificatory question that Professor Bjorkman asks is a really important one, and I don't think it's been resolved yet. Thank you. I think, Kim, could I just say, I think the World Health Organization, which endorsed these kinds of trials in June of this year, might want to set up some sort of global, you know, vaccine court or some way of compensating people who may come to come to become, become ill if the if the World Health Organization is endorsing this. I also think people have a right to information about this. That was one of the principles that in the WHO uh, principles about this is that people have a right to know what's being done, and that's Article 19 of this International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And I think part of it is that people don't have enough information. There may not be the knowledge there, but if there is information, then Kim, your question is how should that be coordinated? And I think the WHO should play a key role in that in that regard. On the question of disability rights, I think people with disabilities who have intellectual disabilities who lack legal capacity should not be in these experiments. I think that we should really take a human rights approach to the question of human challenge trials and move away from using risk benefit analysis. Um, there's some things that should never be done to people, you know, right against genocide, right against slavery, the right against being part of uh, scientific and medical experiments where you can't really give free consent. There's no way to give free consent right now. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify quickly, if I may, that the World Health Organization did not endorse the use of challenge studies against COVID-19. The statement was really, it's key criteria that should be used if such a study were to be done. And I think even within their scientific groups, there was still some disagreement about whether such a study would be ethical if there wasn't a treatment available. So um, neither of the documents that the WHO has produced on the ethics of doing COVID-19 challenge trials that has, has really endorsed these trials. I do think the World Health Organization has a key role to play and would agree with Allison that there is that, you know, in the absence of the kind of global coordination that we would like to see, the World Health Organization is still the best position to do some of that important work. Well, thank you so much. I think that will be the final word. Uh, I, I'd like to thank all of our panelists, Professor Shaw, Professor Bjorkman, Professor Rintown, and Professor Moreno. Thank you so much for this very stimulating and informative panel. Thank you. Thank you.